out of the thousand people, only two people categorized luxury items and uh, things of, of convenience as as very important. Almost everyone doesn't really care about living a luxury lifestyle. So this is where we get back to the human behavior thing of comparing ourselves to others based on the cultural um, metrics of our current lifetime. We don't need all this stuff to be happy. Part of the reasons we think we need all this stuff is we're looking around and we're getting this marketing and advertising that you suck. But if you buy this extra little toy or gadget or Xbox or whatever, you're going to be cool. So I'm just wondering how much of our problems go away when energy surplus goes away. But coupled with that is also do, with as energy surplus goes away, so does some of our technology, our complexity, our interconnectedness, and our food supply. So there, there's that. What do you think, Josh? So this is going to get me off on a little one of my pet interests is uh, you know the relationship between abundance and cooperation, and this is just kind of anecdotal. But I'm very very interested in slime molds, which is a little in the, you know it's a little uh, amoeba like organism. That in conditions of abundance, they all go around hunting on their own, and but when things get scarce, that individual hunting strategy no longer works and they come together in what's called a slug mass and they can send out little pseudopods looking for food sources and they're so efficient at this that they've taken like a topographical map of Spain and put food on the map in a, in a, a proportion to the population of different cities and you put one of these sl slug masses there and it will recreate the transportation infrastructure of Spain as this more efficient way of getting food through cooperation. And that is only that cooperative mechanism is induced entirely by resource scarcity, leading to this kind of perhaps Pollyanna-ish view that as resources become scarce, we really come to depend on each other much more and cooperate much more. And it's interesting that if you look at, you were talking about, um, you know, early cultures and most of them that I know of, they, you know, you individuals never starved, either the group starved or nobody starved. You had mm -hmm. much more egalitarian distribution. I would say, though, that, you know, you talked about um, there were some uh, early groups with uh, resource abundance who did develop. I mean, like, you know, the Northwest um, Indians in America had slaves and hierarchies pre-agriculture. So I think that plasticity is intense in humans. We can evolve different paths. But I think that the conditions we face dictate what cultural approaches are likely to be most successful. And I think it's painfully obvious the conditions we face now do require cooperation at a global scale and massive reduction in consumption. Economists say that we are inherently insatiable. But the last I looked at this, with got the data, it was like early 2000s. We spent the equivalent of the GDP of Canada on advertising, convincing people that they're insatiable. If we were insatiable, you wouldn't need to spend that much to, to convince us we are. Um, getting rid of advertising could be an enormous, play an enormous role in reducing our expectations of you know how much we should consume and how much we should work. It's interesting. I don't have a TV. I gave my TV away in 1999, <laughs> uh, five years before I met you. Cool. I have a screen which yep. I watch Netflix things and. Green Bay Packer games and things like that, but very infrequently. And when I do, I'm just shocked at the stupidness of current advertising. And yeah. it just makes me really squeamish because I've had 20 years without that advertising. Yeah. And now, uh, contrary to when you and I met, but now uh, all the big ad agencies have evolutionary psychologists, PhDs yeah. on staff to you know, really hone in on what what we need to trigger these people to buy stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, the people are so who is adopting these ideas, revolutionary psychology is the the market sector. And, you know, because of the government, we still have this myth of libertarianism, you know, the government should inter intervene in our lives, whereas the private sector, and, and I actually think that social media plays one of the biggest roles in shaping our behaviors and attitudes. Um, you know, the whole goal of social media, of course, is to get people to see more ads. And as it turns out, the way you get people to see more ads is staying online longer is 
sending them highly polarizing information. So at a time we need reduced consumption and greater cooperation, the biggest players in the market economy are focused on polarizing people as a means to get them to see more ads and buy more stuff. And I, I really wonder what future generations, how are they going to look at these people? If they're going to look at them as the equivalent of Adolf Hitler or something, you know, when they know the problems we face and how they're using these brilliant technologies and amazing knowledge of, you know, human psychology.